lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God or respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Jabbok, 
while he stayed behind in the camp alone. This is only the second time in the, in the narrative of Genesis that we have seen Jacob alone. Both scenes happen at night, and after each one, he concludes that he has had an encounter with God. The first time when he was running away from home from Esau a couple of decades earlier, he stopped for the night at a place called Luz and made a simple camp with nothing but a rock for a pillow. Apparently sleeping with, with a rock under your head is conducive to strange dreams because Jacob dreamed of a ladder that stretched between earth and heaven with angels going up and down on it. And in the dream he heard a voice he assumed to be God's with a special message for him. Well, if one didn't know any better, one might assume that God's message to Jacob would be one of rebuke or judgment. Remember, he had just cheated his brother for the second time, he had deceived his own father, and he'd run away from home. <coughs> All his life he'd been a swindler, a mama's boy, and a sneak. And now he had bedded down for the night, not knowing if his brother was hot on his trail or not, and had a dream where God said to him, what? One might guess the message would be, better get used to sleep on them rocks, boy. <laughs> But what he actually heard was this. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. We get into trouble when we read the Bible as a book of moral lessons. There are some of those in there, to be sure, but you also get stuff like this dream of Jacob's and God's coming with David. These are two of the slimiest characters in all the scriptures, and yet they both receive divine favor in lavish abundance. God is funny that way, and it's a real problem for the moralists among us. It would be hard to find two worse examples of ethical behavior or family, family values in all of the Bible, and yet God blesses them beyond all reasonable measure. It doesn't seem quite fair. But then again, it gives me hope that there may be a blessing for me in all my sloppiness as well. Well, Jacob responds to this unexpected and undeserved outpouring of grace in a manner consistent with his character. He looks to strike a bargain. He says, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, if all these things happen, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, not a pillow now, it's a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. An untrustworthy person finds it hard to trust others. A liar always suspects everyone else of lying too. So, hedging his bets in this way, Jacob continues on his way, and God does hold up God's side of the bargain. Now, 20 years later, Jacob finds himself once again alone at night, having sent on ahead all the flocks, herds, servants, wives, and children God has blessed him with, and he's about to return to the land of Canaan so that God can fulfill that part of the, the promise as well. If he ever makes it there alive, that is. The brother he swindled, the brother who vowed to kill him so many years ago, stands between him and the promise. And he realizes that his shady behavior as a young man has the capacity to bring everything crashing to the ground now. And just wait until they see the video. As he sits brooding by the campfire this evening, he finds himself wrestling with his conscience. Before long, however, he finds himself in a literal wrestling match with a mysterious stranger. And here we have one of the most enigmatic passages in all of Genesis, a book that is chock full of enigmatic passages. 
The story smacks of folklore, not only in the way it explains the origin of both a place name and a dietary custom, but also because of its sparseness of language and the fluidity of the characters involved. Is it a man who wrestles with Jacob? Is it an angel? Is it God? Where does this mysterious uh, antagonist come from? And what does it mean that the man could not defeat Jacob, especially if the man is understood to be a divine being? These and other questions complicate our understanding of the passage. What we can say is this. Whether the story was meant to do this or not, it offers a powerful analogy for prayer. It's pretty clear that Jacob is going through a serious inner struggle as he prepares for his reunion with Esau. Whether or not he feels any regret for the choices he has made in his life, we cannot say, but he is obviously fearful about what tomorrow may hold. It may very well have been a real person who found him in the dark and wrestled with him until dawn, but the story works just as well if we understand Jacob's wrestling with the man as merely an outward expression of his inner turmoil. If we look at it that way, as a representation of Jacob's night of anguished prayer, we can tease out some insights that may, we may find helpful when we find ourselves in similar circumstances. First of all, prayer can be a kind of combat. It's not always that way, but from time to time we may find ourselves in conflict with God. Now those of us who have been brought up in, in a pietistic tradition that says our only role in prayer is to submit, humbly submit our wills to the will of God, may be uncomfortable with this idea. But for the people who wrote the scriptures, there was no impiety in conceiving of prayer as conflict or protest. Many of the psalms reflect this kind of combative relationship between the psalmist and God. Job harangues God over the course of 30 chapters, basically declaring his own righteousness and complaining that God has treated him unfairly. Jeremiah flat out accuses God of deceiving him. And in Gethsemane, Jesus himself resists for a long time before finally agreeing to align his will with God's. Jacob here finds himself in what feels like literal combat with God. A second thing to note is that persistence is a vital part of prayer. We see this here where Jacob wrestles his opponent to a draw all, all night long. And we see it in today's gospel lesson where the widow keeps pestering the judge until he finally agrees to hear her case. Jacob refuses to let go until he receives a blessing. The widow perseveres until she attains justice. Third, it is only through the protracted struggle, our persistent wrestling with the elusive mystery of God, that we are able to discern God's true presence and character. At the outset of Jacob's story, we are told only that a man wrestled with him until daybreak. It is only after the night-long struggle, and in fact only in retrospect, that Jacob realizes who his opponent really was. Only at the end of the wrestling match does the penny drop. Verse 30 reads, So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The same holds true for us. If we are unwilling to put in the time to invest ourselves in the struggle, we will never have more than a superficial understanding of who God is. In faithful conflict, we achieve knowing. Fourth, this story teaches us that true prayer can leave us wounded. In the course of the wrestling match, the mysterious figure strikes Jacob on the hip socket, knocking his hip out of joint. Still, he does not give in and continues striving until he finally receives the blessing. The story ends with Jacob walking away from the camp and toward his uncertain appointment with Esau as the sun rises, limping because of his hip. Jacob found that wrestling with God is dangerous business, and we will too. 
We cannot enter into the faithful combat of prayer expecting to emerge unscathed. After Jesus' time of prayer ended with his commitment to follow through on his mission so that God's will and not his own would be done, he limped away from the garden toward Golgotha. And when we put ourselves on the line, when we say, Thy will be done, and mean it, God just might take us at our word. And we may find ourselves limping away from our time of prayer, a terrible blessing in hand. There's another element of prayer, an element that God invites us to receive as good news, that we find in the reading from Luke. Jesus tells of the widow who continually brings her suit to a judge who neither fears God nor respects people. Even though the judge doesn't give a rip about the widow's welfare, he eventually grants her justice because her persistent demands wear him down. The most common interpretation of this parable is that the judge stands for God and the widow represents all who bring their petitions before God in prayer. But one whom Jesus describes as having no fear of God or respect of people seems like a curious choice for a God figure. What if instead we saw the widow as the one who represents God? In her persistence in calling for justice, she is like God who continually sends preachers and prophets and gadflies to peck away at the powers of the world in an effort to get them to do the right thing. Some people will not find this picture of God satisfactory, and I understand that. We want an omnipotent, irresistible God who can implement God's will with the snap of the divine fingers. But we have to ask ourselves, if that's the nature of God, why does sin and evil seem so entrenched in the world? Where is all that finger snapping when they need it in Syria? when they needed it in Rwanda, in Darfur, in Bergen-Belsen. What we see instead is a world in which evildoers prosper and the righteous suffer, where injustice is pervasive and violence reigns. But, as I have argued before, here in this pulpit, in the things I write in my book, God's power is of a different kind than that of the despots and tyrants of the world. God does not rule by force. God governs by persuasion. And we have the power to resist. Remember that in the wrestling match, God was unable to overpower Jacob. And the new name Jacob received, Israel, meant one who had striven with God and with humans and had prevailed. Like us, the unjust judges of the world are resistant to God's pleas and persuasions, but God, like the persistent widow, never gives up. The promise of the parable is that in the end, the cause of justice will prevail. God's reign will be realized on earth. God's vision for the world will become a reality. These things will happen because God will continue to send those prophets and gadflies to demand that the powers act with justice and conform themselves to God's will, and their persistence will win out. The good news is that we get to be those prophets. We get to play the role of the widow who demands justice until the unjust judge gets worn down and gives in. We get to play the role of Jacob, stubbornly hanging on to our adversary until we get the blessing we have been looking for. A blessing that is not just for us, but for the whole world. Amen. Our human response today comes uh, from uh, hymnal number 16.